Uh, Nate will be joining us shortly here, and uh, uh, we do want to get started. It is uh, twelve oh three, so we want to make sure that uh, we get uh, everything we want to get covered during this webinar. Uh, we are also streaming live now on Facebook, so if something that comes up, you miss it, it's already recorded uh, on Facebook, and you can go back to access it. But first, let me uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a webinar to talk about first-time home purchase, so it's a it's an exciting topic both. Alan, his team, Nikki and her team, this is, a, and our team, of course, uh, is a topic that we really love talking about because there's so much education that goes on, right? Wouldn't you guys agree? It's, it's a topic that I think we all enjoy very much, right? And yes, so, definitely. yeah, and so I think, yeah. um, you know, for us, the, the main thing about this topic is uh, not only uh, to talk about all the different pieces that go, are involved in the home purchase, the first time home purchase, but the education behind making you comfortable, making sure the numbers make sense for you. And then also from Alan and his team, understanding how the offers look like, right? What's the nuances there? So a lot of things that we would like to cover. Uh, so how we're gonna break up this webinar today, uh, first off is there's a Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, if you click on that uh, box, you're gonna be able to ask us questions live. Uh, Raymond and Amy uh, is also gonna help us uh, run through those questions and make sure that we get them either answered on the air or through a, a direct text to you guys. Uh, and then uh, in terms of the topics, we're going to start out. Nikki has been so kind for us to put together a presentation. She's going to run through this presentation with us. Uh, visually, there's, there's some things to be looking at as well. Uh, and from there, uh, you know, uh, myself, uh, Raymond, and Nate will be jumping in just to touch upon little pieces that we want to elaborate on, right? And so uh, we'll be able to talk through uh, getting you comfortable about the numbers themselves. Uh, from there, Alan and his team is going to jump in and talk more about the actual process of putting the offer and understanding that part. So that's the exciting part, right? So Nikki and I have been talking about how we go through all the numbers and the financials, you know, a little bit boring sometimes, but it's about getting you comfortable and ready so that you can get to Alan and, and really make that purchase, okay? Um, and so... Uh, I'm going to also uh, do a quick introduction of everybody that's on here on the panelists. Uh, so you can see, uh, actually, Alan, I'm going to let you introduce uh, your team and, uh, uh, you know, Jacob and, and Nikki and Mike. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Alan Canis, and I'm the owner and founder of Canis Realty. And I'm not sure how everybody's showing up on the screen, but um, below me is Jake. And we have Nikki Zanis. Um, those are both um, agents on the team. And below them is, um, uh, we've got Megan Mitchell, who is the assistant, who is also a licensed agent. And then we have um, Amy Middleman, who is our director of marketing, who is also on the team. So welcome, everybody. Awesome. Say hello. Thanks for hello. Yeah. <laughs> there <laughs> we can go. hear you. It's okay. You can say so, hi. Don't it's just so that back. everybody knows. Um, uh, with them, every, uh, even though we have a team, people don't get handed off to everybody on the team. Everybody works hand in hand to just ensure that our clients get the best results. And so that's how a team outperforms an individual. That's one of our mottos. A team outperforms an individual because we get you more. That's another motto. <laughs> Awesome. And then, Nikki, why don't you give a little bit of introduction of uh, your little bit of background and, and so everyone gets to know you as well. Sure. I'm feeling like I need a motto, but I don't have a motto to start with. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so hello. Welcome, everybody. Yes, I'm Nikki James. I'm with Opus Advisors, and I have been in the lending industry for many years. I funded my first loan in the early 90s and seen lots of different markets. This is a phenomenal market to buy. When I started, we have interest rates at 9.875. So um, anyway, nice to meet you all. I'll be going through some slides here in a second, but uh, look forward to, to teaching awesome. you. I'm very passionate about education. Yeah, and so um, we're going to get started uh, for on my end. Just I, We always start the webinars with a slight market update, uh, and, and I'm talking the, 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 the capital markets, the stock markets. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think the surprising thing for everybody is how quickly the markets have recovered. So uh, in our previous webinar series, I was talking about if you haven't looked at your account recently because you're scared, you might want to go back and take a look and realize that it's, it doesn't look that bad in most cases. And so there are a lot of different sectors of the market, especially in the U.S., that are really positive at the moment. It's like the growth sector. A lot of the tech companies are, are fairly 
uh, uh, S&P 500, so the 500 biggest companies in the U.S., uh, you know, as of last week, it started to break even. We saw a little bit of a dip. There were some, you know, worries of coronavirus cases going back up. But having said that, we're actually uh, not in a bad place, surprisingly, I think, for a lot of people. And, and to be seen, if we see uh, more volatility, I think our, our opinion is that there's definitely going to be more volatility. But relative to the house purchase right now, right? I mean, if your assets are invested, your down payment is invested, hopefully not too aggressively, that's something that you should go back and take a look and say, hey, maybe I can uh, not be so worried about taking the money out of the market to make this home purchase because that's a long-term goal that you want to achieve, okay? Um, and so that's a, a, a you know, concern of uh, for clients about when to take some money out, how to do so, we always recommend if you're thinking about a purchase in the next six to 12 months, it's probably best that you don't have your money in the market right now because it's too short of a time. Again, outside of what's going on exactly today, it's just too short of a time to take some market risk. Okay, awesome. So then, uh, Nikki, why don't you get us started, uh, have your screen uh, shared with the presentation and, and, and start walking us through kind of the way that you uh, think about uh, the, the numbers and, and understanding the, um, you know, qualifications for getting into a home. Absolutely. And hang on. All right. Sorry about that. I think you guys had a picture of my, my, my daughter there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I couldn't figure out how not to do that. Sorry, guys. All right. Um, so yes. Um, hello and welcome. And here we go. So I'm going to give, um, you know, I'm going to go into some detail. I can go into a lot more detail. I'm going to try and keep it somewhat high level. But just to start to orient you to when you're thinking about buying a house, it's sort of like, well, where do I start? Where do I go? Who do I go to? So I thought this was important to just cover that in the world of lending, there's three kind of main distinctions for institutions that you will hear of. So you may hear of a friend say, I went to Wells Fargo or Chase or um, Diversified Capital or Guaranteed Rate or you know, where do all of these fit? Why would I go to one versus another? So there's three distinctions, retail lending, retail banking is your Wells, Chase, B of A, the big banks that you've heard of. Um, down below, we've got mortgage banking. Mortgage banking is an institution that lends their own money. They fund the loans, they do all the work themselves, they underwrite everything. But then after the close, they sell the loans to the secondary market, which could be um, some of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac you may have heard of, I'll go into that in a second. Or it could be to um, Belt, Wells and Chase, they buy mortgages, or it could be on the secondary market as a mortgage-backed security. The reason that you care about this is just knowing um, what options of lending that you have. A mortgage broker is uh, more set for a creative type of underwriting, unusual type of products, people with income out of the country, or sometimes we'll have people with just unusual credit profiles. So, I sit actually unusually in all three buckets. We were a mortgage bank with the ability to broker, and then we were purchased by Flagstar, who is a national lender. So I actually sit in all three buckets, which for me gives me the option to look at everything for you, the, 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 the best options that are out there. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the world of lending. Um, when you go to Wells or you go to Chase, you get what their rules are, what their guidelines are. Um, and so um, just know that that's the distinction there. So I just mentioned very briefly Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I'm gonna explain the difference here, um, just so you can know this affects you when you're asking for to be qualified. So Fannie and Freddie are two, uh, quasi governmental agencies that buy mortgages from banks so that banks can then go out and lend them to somebody else. Otherwise they'd run out of savings deposits. They'd have to, um, to stop lending. So Fannie and Freddie keep the mortgage market liquid, which is important to you because when, the, when there is liquidity, that means we can lend more money, which means that the money is not as expensive. So um, Fannie and Freddie buy loans up to, in our area, up to $765. We're considered, in case you hadn't noticed, a high cost area. Um, and so we have a higher limit than the rest of the country or many places in the rest of the country. So those loans are called conformings because they conform to Fannie and Freddie's rules. When we go above 765, we get into call, what we call non-conforming, which is they don't conform to Fannie and Freddie's rules or jumbo. Those are the two terms you'll hear, it's the same thing. The jumbo bucket, um, those loans do get sold, but they get sold on the secondary market, as I said earlier, as either mortgage-backed securities or to some of the big banks that actually buy mortgages to hold. So when I'm working in my mortgage banking capacity on a non-conforming loan, my bank sometimes securitizes them, packages them as a nice little bow and then sells them on Wall Street. Sometimes we sell them to Chase or Wells or things like that. 
The reason that we had a big change, if you had heard, maybe heard um, in the mortgage industry recently with the COVID things, was that secondary market froze, it went away. So there weren't any trades of mortgage-backed securities, which meant that the jumbo market got very tight for a while. Uh, it's slowly opening up, but that might be relevant for you if you're out looking here um, right now. <clears throat> so what do lenders look at? What do, why do we ask what we ask? So we look at your debt, we look at your income, we look at the house, which we call the collateral. It's collateral for our loan. If you default, we get to take your house. We don't want to, we don't want to own your house, but that's our collateral. Um, we look at credit. So we look at your depth of credit, um, which is where we're looking at your debt. How much have you borrowed in the past? I recently had a client who came to me and she had one credit card for 300 and that was all she had ever borrowed and she was so proud of herself. And I said, okay, and you wanna borrow a million dollars and you've only ever shown me you can pay back 300 bucks. <laughs> that was tough. Um, I'll talk more about that when we get into that section. And then we look at your assets. How much money do you have saved for not only the down payment, but closing costs and reserves. So I'll go through that. Each, each one of these five here a bit more, we'll drill in a bit more detail. So credit and depth um, and debt. Uh, the depth of credit, like I said, is really important. So most people focus on scores. Everybody knows, oh, I have a great credit score. Just know that your mortgage credit score might be lower than your, you'll see on Credit Karma because we have a different calculation. It's a bit more strict because we're borrowing, we're lending you a lot more money. The mortgage is pretty much the largest thing you'll borrow. Um, so to get the best score, Overall, if you have um, three credit cards with a $1,000 balance on each and each one of them has a limit of 3,000, that's great, you're under a third utilization. If you have one credit card and you think, I'm great, I only keep one credit card, but that credit card has a $3,000 balance with a $3,000 limit, you will find your score can be up to 100 points lower in a mortgage scoring because you are 100% extended on that credit card and we don't like to see that. So if you have, um, the ability, if you are needing to carry credit card debt, spread it out. It's better to have it spread out than it is to have it on one thing. Currently, you can pay off credit today and tomorrow your score will be better and we will use the better score. If we, so sometimes I'll pull credit and I'll see some high balances and I'll tell somebody, pay those down. Then we rescore and we can use that new rescore. That is changing in the future. They are getting smart and they're going to be going to a two-year average of utilization. So they will look at what are your habits. So just get in a better habit now to sort of spread it out. Don't try not to keep a card maxed out. Um, we're looking Can I ask you a question on this quick, quickly, Absolutely. Nikki? Sorry to interrupt you. And Absolutely. sorry for joining later. I had a client in a uh, bidding war, actually, oh, as this is happening. So <laughs> very interesting. Very well um, but I actually had a client who literally just had one uh, credit card uh, to her name and was wanting and saw this note. Um, on a similar, similar website saying, hey, you should have three trade lines and immediately went out and just got two more credit cards. Is that a good thing or a bad thing uh, in taking action in that way? If you're looking to buy today, it's a bad thing. If you're looking to buy in two years time, it's a great thing. If you're looking to buy in a year's time, it still doesn't help. We want, the, the magic rule right. is we want three trade lines that are at least two years old and have been active in the last year. So that's, that's the best thing. So to maintain the healthiest credit depth, three trade lines, at least two years old, at least active in the last year. Now, it can help her in six months, just in, it won't hurt her, but it still won't get counted as an added trade line. So great question there. Got it. So, I have another, uh, well, yeah, I have another question, Nikki. Uh, it, uh, I've seen in the past where if somebody pays off the card, it takes some time to update. And I think you were saying that it gets like, um, like you guys see it immediately? Is it you guys still? Because uh, I see it's some a, credit scores take some time to update, right, themselves. And so, yeah. how does the timing work on paying it out? So organically, it can be up to thirty days, two weeks to thirty days. It used to be that we actually sent in that. This is I'm going aging myself. They sent in the actual tapes, you know, each month to the credit agencies. That was the way it was done. Of course, now it's online. It's a lot faster, but it can take longer. But what we can do is what's called a rapid rescore. So as a lender, we can go in, we can take your statement showing a zero balance. We can go in and we can rescore the credit with the new balance. So that is immediate. It's like, you know, it takes us 24 hours to pull those. We can also do credit simulations. So once we pulled your credit score, if we're seeing there's an issue, we can say, well, what if we paid off that? How much does it increase the score? Or what if we, you know, did this? What does it increase the score? So we can play around to tell you exactly what you need to do to get wherever we need to get the Awesome. Yeah, thank yeah, you so much. And yeah, Nick, yeah. one more thing. Correct me if I'm wrong on this as well, or 
um, you also don't want your credit cards to be 51% over their balance, correct? Yeah, that's what I was, yes, exactly. So you wanna keep it under a third if you can. Under okay. a third is the ultimate best. Under a half is better and don't go over a half. <laughs> you can keep those balances rolling, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, managing debt is okay. We don't mind if somebody's managing their debt. They're paying it on time and they're keeping the balance low. So, you know, don't freak out about having a balance other than the fact that you have to pay interest on it. And there are yeah. financial, wonderful financial people here. I'll tell you, don't do that. But because it's not, you know, you don't want to pay high interest. But yes, in terms of rolling, a, uh, that doesn't matter to your score. You just want to keep it under a third if you can. Gotcha. Um, and let's see. Um, Collections are nasty. They, I just, I have a client right now who just has a hundred and she's a doctor, bless her heart, and she has a hundred and fifteen dollar medical bill. They are the worst. Medical bills are the worst. They go to, they go to collection fast, but they did change the rules, where even if you go to collection, you have ninety days before they were now reported on your credit report. So just pay attention to those. If you're waiting for the insurance to come through and you've got, you know, you just want to make sure, just pay attention. And if you get that collection word in anything, call them up and pay it right away. It is not worth fighting over a hundred dollar bill that you don't think you own, that you owe, to then go and end up having a credit score that on your mortgage you're ending up paying a half or a full point higher interest rate on that entire balance because you fought over that hundred dollars. So just yeah. you know, watch those. <laughs> and it's worth spending some time on this because the credit score does affect the pricing and it ultimately affects the, the affordability. Um, and so I think a lot of you know, clients have questions around this. Um, and one actually came through asking, is it three trade lines per individual or per couple if they're filing together or, or, or applying great together? Question. It's a great question. So it's actually per individual. So sometimes we will take somebody off the loan application if they're hurting the, the credit depth. So we do that frequently. If their income isn't sufficient or doesn't matter, we don't need their income, sometimes we'll take them off. You can buy a house and both be on the title but one of you could not be on the loan. So it's both of you. And if you're an authorized user, in the, in the, in, so by the way, all I'm talking about right here is relevant in the jumbo world. So that's the big loan world. In the conforming world, you just need a score. They don't care about depth. So I'm talking jumbo world, which is pretty much most of our clients because houses are expensive. So um, if you're an authorized user, not all investors will count that as a trade line. So if you're on your parents' account or on your husband's account or your wife's account it, as an authorized user, it doesn't always count for your depth. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, that's, you know, basically it's, we look at both of you. So if both of you have a car that you bought together, that counts as one one. So I literally sit there with my fingers and I go, you know, do they both, do they both? And when I got my three, I'm like, okay, good, I'm good. I got my three. Great. Thank you, Nikki, for that. You're welcome. Um, this is important, just uh, rental history. So um, if you're buying in the jumbo market, uh, we want to see that you've paid your rent on time for the last 12 months. That is a good indication to us that you're going to pay your mortgage on time. If you have a lease and you're not the main leaseholder, we're going to want to see that you've paid your, if you're paying your friend, that you've paid them on time but don't pay them in kind. Hey, I'm gonna pay for that vacation, you pay for the rent this month. Keep it consistent, pay it. Venmo is hard, Venmo is hard for us to track. I know we love Venmo, I love Venmo, but it's hard for us to get the history in there. You, you, the check is obviously the old fashioned way, but if you do an online deposit, do an automatic deposit to whomever it is, friend or landlord, every month on the first of the month, so it's consistent. Now, oh, I was on vacation and I didn't pay my rent, and my friend, they didn't care, I got back, I paid them. That's a problem for us, because are you gonna do that to your mortgage and say, well, you know, I was on vacation, I didn't wanna pay you on time. So pay it on time every month consistently. It, it is, it can be a problem. If you're in the middle of a lease and you're buying a house, we have to buy out that lease. So we have to calculate in our reserves that you have enough money to make the lease in case you can't get out of it. Sometimes you can get out of it because you can find somebody else. But in the event that you haven't, you say, well, I'm going to, it doesn't matter. If you still have six months left on the lease, I have to take six months of your lease and set that money aside, knowing that you're legally obligated to pay that. Um, and a question came through on that one too, Nikki, like you mentioned yeah. Venmo, does that apply to things like Zelle and other payments, like other, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it's basically hard for us to get a history. So if you can pull a report, so if Zelle's better than Venmo and you can pull a report, go for it. But Venmo, 
you know, you if you pull a report, we're going to see the, you know, 10 bucks to my friend for, his, for the hamburger, you know, we're going to see on all of the emojis, you know, and we're going to have to sort of circle all of the mortgage, I mean, the rent payments through it. I don't know if Zell, you can pull a report of just that one particular uh, payee, the person that you're paying. If you can, that's great. If we can see 12 months that you pay them every month on the first of the month, that's what we're looking for. The other way to do it is, of course, just to go into your, well, you wouldn't, you know, I was going to say go into your bank account. So if you're paying it from your bank account in an online bill pay, you can actually sort by that bill pay, which makes it easier. All right, happy to ask, ask, answer more on that, but we're going to move on. So just um, remember the five things that we're looking at, you know, um, income is the second one. So salaries are golden. We use your salary as soon as you get it. Um, if you get a new raise, we count it right away. Salary is considered guaranteed, but watch for job gaps. So if for some reason you did take some time off, traveled the world, or um, you know, were between jobs, in that jumbo world, we're really looking for you to be back on your job for six months after you've had that six month job gap. And we'll go back and look at two year history prior to the job gap. Now, if prior to the job gap, you were in grad school or something, then that's considered a job. We get a copy of your diploma and we say, okay, that was a fair thing that you were doing. We basically don't want you sitting around doing nothing for three years and saying, oh, I want to buy a house, I'll go find a job, here's a job, hey, you know, let me qualify. We want to see that there's a history of income because you've got 30 years to pay us. So we want to make sure that you're good for it. Um, commission, bonus, anything that is variable, we average it for the last two years. So we're going to look at what you've received. Bonuses, sign-on bonuses don't count. Retention bonuses don't count because they are a one-time thing. Looking at what was your performance bonus, what is part of your actual ongoing compensation. If for any reason it's declining, we're going to use the last 12 months. So if 18 was higher than 19, we're not going to use a 24-month average. We're going to use a 12-month average of 19. We're also going to look for, have you received anything year-to-date? If you've received zero year-to-date in, in 2020, we might ask you for a note from your employer stating that, but bonuses aren't paid until October. Then we're like, okay, well, there's a reason why you haven't gotten it. But if they're paid once a quarter and you haven't had anything yet, we're going to want to know why and might not use, use your bonus in the qualifying. And I'm gonna go into qualifying here shortly as to how we look at that. Um, same with commissions. Commissions and bonuses are the same. RSUs are what, uh, awesome. We obviously, uh, most of clients in this area have RSU income. RSU is a, your restricted stock units. It's another way for a company to compensate you. We have a complicated calculation of how we give you income credit for it. We basically look at the last two years of the stock price. We take the average price over the last two years. We take what the price of the stock is today. We then times that amount by the average number of shares you've had and sold in the last two years, or the lower of how many you've got going forward for the next three years. So you do have to have a three-year continuance. That comes a problem with Amazon. They, for whatever reason, don't do a three-year continuance on their grants. Um, we also, um, you have to invest it. So that's two years of investing. So if you've been at a company for a year, and then you vest for two years, because you take your year before you get your first tranche invested. So you really have to be there three years before we're using that income. Not always the case, but that's sort of a general rule. Is there? And I think that's gonna to apply to pretty much almost any of our clients here in the Bay Area with RSU yeah. income. Uh, yeah. And what, I, what we find a lot over here at Compass is a lot of those clients never sell that stock either. So it's not only from an income perspective, but also a huge help in a down payment perspective. Um, so trying to talk with someone through, you know, how, what do I sell? What lots do I sell? Do I use this for any of my down payment? I think it's going to be a very necessary conversation as you think about making that purchase too. Uh, a lot of people don't even know how to sell it, to be honest. Um, so we even walk some of our clients through the logistics of hopping into E-Trade or Fidelity and actually going through that process of, of selling their stock. Because I got to tell you, it's very common for a lot of our clients to have 50% of their net worth tied to their company stock. And obviously that's going to be very stressful if the market's moving pretty dramatically. Um, so yeah. RSUs, I mean, everyone's going to come across this in the Bay Area, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and another thing to add to that too would be just watch out for blackout windows, right? Because if we're thinking about buying over the next six to 12 months and you're in a blackout window and you haven't sold, that could be an issue in getting that income towards that down payment, right? And so uh, that's something that we can work with you guys, uh, our clients about in talking through that. But, but again, those that are not our client, just think about, look up what your blackout window is and make sure that the timing is, is adequate for you to be able to liquidate your stock. Um, and as you liquidate, it's good to make sure just as an expectation that 
there could be some capital gains that you need to pay on that. So of course, getting into a house, there's a lot of money involved, a lot of big numbers moving around. And the last thing that you want to have is come April next year, you also have a big tax bill from the sale, right? So it's about expectations and managing it. And that will help with the nerves around making this big purchase. All great points, yes, thank you. All right, moving on to assets. So basically we're looking for enough money to cover the down payment the reserves, which is what you have left over after the close, and the closing costs. I'll go through those in a little while, but um, basically uh, in the jumbo market, six months reserves is what we need. So we look at your savings, your stocks. We do, we don't, this is crazy. I don't know when we're gonna get wise to this, but we don't, we don't actually take into account that cap gains that you were just talking about. So I'll look at an account I know. So I'm looking at it going, yeah, we don't really have, you know, 500,000 available. We maybe have 300,000 available. But from an underwriting standpoint, we actually look at it. So um, someday they'll get wise to that, but so far we're good on that. Um, 401ks, um, just a note here, it's, it's a very great option for you to be able to use your 401k as part of the down payment. You can take a loan against your 401k in most 401ks, not IRS, but the 401k with your current company, up to 50% of the balance typically. And um, Alfred, I know that just changed. Is that correct from 50,000? Yeah. And so, so, so some of those regulations around it because of the coronavirus, um, they relax them a little bit to allow for not just uh, 50K up, you know, up to like 50%, but they're allowing for a hundred K uh, potentially on, on a borrowing. And, uh, and that's crucial again, um, you know, just with uh, the need for liquidity, they've changed that and, and but it doesn't state necessarily what it needs to be used for. Now, the payback time period on those loans uh, vary. And so you should check with the provider to see. But a lot of times if it's used for a first time home purchase or just a home purchase in general, it doesn't even have to be a first time, then the payback period can be slightly longer. I think on average, it's five years normally, and it could be longer for a home purchase. Yeah. I just had one that was something there. else to note on that really quick too is uh, I think one of the reasons you don't count 401k loans as a debt against them is they pay that interest back to themselves. Um, so there is an interest charge, but it just goes back into your own 401k plan. So you're paying yourself that interest. That's a pretty cool plan uh, available to you. This is really making a difference for quite a few home buyers that I'm working with as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a great way to leverage your savings that you're not going to need for many, many years um, without taking the tax hit. You've put it away pre-tax and you're not going to pay a penalty on it. Um, there are some programs right now, the CARE Act came out and they, they changed it where you can withdraw more penalty free, but I'm sure you guys are the same as me. We don't advise that. Take the loan, don't take the cash out because then you're going to, you are going to pay the income tax. On it. Yeah, definitely. Loans are simpler without the taxes and also there's some confusion a lot of times about being double taxed on it because when you pay back the loan, they take it post tax. Like they think, Oh, well I took it out or, or when I contributed, right. Um, you know, uh, it would, or contribute back to the loan. I'm, I'm, it's a post tax contribution. And now when I distribute it, when I'm retiring, it's another taxation. So they're worried about it being double taxed, but just remember, it's not something easy to explain over webinar, but it actually equals out because when you take the loan out, they don't tax you on it. So you're using actually a much bigger portion of those dollars immediately. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Just a quick bullet point there. Cryptocurrency must be sold. We can't, we, we, you can't um, use it as reserves and have it sit there. We're seeing more of that. Super fun. All right. Interesting that there's even regulation guidance on it now. I know. Yeah, that changed. At first, when it came out, you know, the underwriters were like, what is this? It's Hoko, yeah, Hocus Pocus. Right. Funny money. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, okay, maybe it's real. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I had some guy who had about a million that he had put away. I don't know. It was ridiculous, like $800 or something right at the beginning. Very smart guy. Fortunately, I didn't know him early enough. <laughs> anyway, um, moving on. So cash required. So down payments. In the small loans, those conforming loans, you can go as low as 3.5%. <clears throat> that would be a loan called an FHA loan, which is a government loan, Federal Housing Administration. Most clients in this area probably, <clears throat> excuse me, aren't going to be um, in that bucket. But if you are, it's a great way to put low down payment on a house. Uh, there is some downsides to it, which we would go into, but it's an option. In the jumbo world, we're mostly looking for 10% down. We have a special program that we call our community loan at Flagstar because we're in a high cost area. We actually have a 10% down loan up to a million and a half loan amount with no mortgage insurance, which I'll go into in a little while. So it, 
It just, and it has low reserve requirements. So the problem is, is many of the loans that allow loan down payments then require a high reserve. What you've got left over after the close. And the, the comment is, well, if I had the money, I'd just put it in the house. You know, <laughs> there is, you know, needing to have those reserves is challenging. So our particular 10% down on their um, portfolio product is, um, it does allow that to low down payment without the high reserves. So reserves conforming, we're just looking for three months. But in the jumbo, well, most of it is six months. Um, each lender has a different rule. For example, Chase um, is more flexible on reserves versus Wells requires six months of um, half of the reserves to be in your non-retirement and half can be in retirement, whereas Chase allows it all to be in retirement. So we're always looking for what bucket do you fit in? You know, if you, if you, if you don't have that <clears throat> limitation, then we're just going to look for the lowest rate. But some people might be wiping out everything that's liquid and have nothing left except 401k reserves. So then we would have to look at a, a specific loan product. Just as a note, when you take that 401k loan out, we do have to deduct that from the amount available clearly for reserves. Um, closing costs, the top right there. Budget from 1.5 of the loan amount, that's going to be high and it's not all costs, but it's cash flow. So when you buy a house, you not only have to put the down payment down, <clears throat> you have to pay the closing costs, which um, this webinar is not long enough for me to go into detail on that, but basically there's escrow and title fees, there's county fees, there's transfer tax taxes, there's recording fees. Those are more like probably 0.8%. But from a cash flow perspective, depending on when you're buying, you may have property taxes that are due if the seller's already paid in the installment that you're in. Um, there may be, um, you'll have your full year of fire insurance and you'll also have interest to pay through the month. Um, so just from a cash flow perspective, one and a half percent is a good kind of average. It's not all costs. Just remember that because if you don't like property taxes and you don't like interest and you don't like fire insurance, don't buy a house because they recur every single month. You, have to, you don't actually pay them monthly, but we budget for them monthly, which I will go into here. So this is now we're getting into, well, how do I qualify? How do I figure out if I can afford a house? So you've got your mortgage payment on the left column, your principal and interest. That's what you pay the bank. But as I said a second ago, if you don't like taxes and insurance, don't buy a house because you have to budget for those monthly. Taxes are paid in most areas around here twice a year, December and April. Um, and insurance is paid on the anniversary. You pay your first year premium up front and then you pay on your anniversary each year thereafter. So taxes are, have to be paid. If you don't pay your property taxes, um, our loan actually wouldn't get paid off. If you went into default, your taxes would get paid first. So we care that you budget to have enough money to pay taxes. We care that you have insurance because if the house burns down, we know you're probably not gonna come up with a million dollars to build the house again. So we make sure that you maintain insurance at all times. Not earthquake, we don't require earthquake, but we do require fire insurance. So what we do is we take that PITI, principal interest tax insurance, we add onto it, well, so the, the top ratio is called the housing ratio. We don't pay a ton of attention to that these days. In the old days, we used to pay more attention. We're really looking at PITI plus other debt car loans, credit cards, student loans, divided by your income. And that's what we call your debt to income ratio. And in the jumbo market, we are stuck at 43, pretty much. There are some exceptions. Some of our portfolio loans allow us to go to 48, 49%. A portfolio loan is just a loan that sits on the books. It's non-saleable. It's more creative. It allows us to be a little bit more flexible. So we have some portfolio loans in the jumbo market that will go higher debt to income ratios for different reasons. So that's the calculation. So we're gonna run through an example here. So we have somebody with $165,000 income, that's $13,750 a month, on a million dollar home with a 20% down payment. So that PITI is your principal and interest, that's the 3592, that's what you pay the bank. Your property taxes, your insurance, probably is a condo in the, in the city for sure. So $400 for condo dues we threw in here. So that's your PITI, principal interest, tax and insurance, and home owners dues. Um, plus your student loan, let's say a car loan. So your total PITI plus other debt in this example, 5848 divided by your monthly income of 13750 is 42 and a half, magically. It can go to 43. So that's, that's the income required to, to qualify for a, a million dollar condo in the city. So working backwards, you know, what income do I need if I wanted to buy a million and a half? It doesn't have to be a condo, but just in this case it is just because, you know, in the city we're often in getting into the condo dues. So a million and a half home, let's say we put 20% down again, 300,000, 
reminder, we do have programs without 20%. This is just to show you the math. The point of this is just to show you the math. So your principal interest, your taxes, your insurance, your homeowner's dues, your PITI is 7415 plus your other debt, 8165. So that divided by 43 is what? What income do I need? It's about 226,000 a year is the income required between the two of you. Base salary, if there's two of you, base salary and the bonus averages is the income required to buy a, a condo high level. All right, awesome. this next one, this next one's fun. Um, I'm gonna go through it and then you guys jump in and, and uh, you, I know you want have more to add here. And I, I have to point out my little circle in the bottom, which is a rough, ca rough calculation for demonstration purposes. And I am not a CPA. <laughs> <laughs> These guys can be more accurate than me. So just high level, the tax benefit of buying a home. So you've heard people say you should buy a house. It, it makes sense. I know I run the numbers a lot and these guys do too. It always makes sense to buy a house versus renting in this area, always. Because when you're paying your mortgage, you're paying principal interest payments. So your mortgage is going down each month. It's not all just going to the landlord. Some of it's going down into, into, your, into your loan and the house is appreciating. So that's how you build wealth. Is the house appreciating and the loan being paid down? But there's also a tax benefit. So if we look at a million dollar home, you've got an $800,000 loan. That was the principal and interest payment. Of that, 2343 is deductible. So the new rules um, that came out a couple of years ago in the, in the new tax changes are up to $750,000. Interest on 750 is deductible. And also $10,000 a year of maximum property taxes. So your property taxes in this area are likely to cost you more than 10K, but you can deduct the 10K. So that amount is tax deductible. 38,000 a year is tax deductible. So you don't pay income tax on it. So if you earn $200,000, you take $200,000 minus 38,100, and that's what you're gonna pay income tax on. So in a 41% tax bracket, it's a rough savings of 15,000 a year, roughly. And how you see this is you see, um, you have a W-4 form with your employer. You probably a single and zero or married and zero, no dependents, no deductions. When you buy a house, you can change that. Or don't do it and you'll just get a tax, you'll get a, a, a refund back at the end of the year. You guys want to add to that? Yeah, so maybe just a little bit on the uh, property tax deduction. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the big complaints that a lot of high income states like California and New York have been having ever since the 2017 tax legislation, which also reduced this from, seven, from 1 million down to 750 is also there's a limit on the state and local tax deduction, SALT tax of 10K. SALT tax includes things like property tax. It also includes what you may pay to California for your own state tax withholding. So for most people, we probably pay about 9% state tax. So if you make $200,000 or more, you're probably already hitting that $10,000 limit on the state and local taxes by what you withhold to California anyways. So any incremental property tax deduction isn't going to be helpful for those people because they're already hitting that limit. So it depends on how you look at it. But for us, we're looking at people that don't own a home, probably already hit that salt limit. And so adding that property tax may not be helpful. But one of the things that we do as your advisor is exactly what Nikki's pointing to, and that's looking at your W-4 withholdings. Once you've made this purchase, let's see what actually applies to you, what mortgage interest deductions we can take, what uh, property tax deductions we can make, and let's adjust that W-4 so you're getting better cash flow during the year as opposed to waiting for a $15,000 refund from the IRS. I don't know about you, but I'm not so interested in giving a free loan to the IRS. I'd rather have that money now. Well, and also I wanna to just touch on that as well. Um, besides that, you're also building your own personal wealth rather than paying somebody else's mortgage by paying rent. I mean, that's really the biggest component. Why pay somebody else's mortgage? Yeah, I think that's huge, right? To remember that, I mean, yes, there are costs on both sides. Like we evaluate that and go through that. Yes, renting has the sunken cost, buying your home, right? Part of it is sunken cost, right? Like the interest, right? Some of those costs isn't something you would have had if you continued renting. But to, I think all of the panelists' point right here is that, over time, and I mean, this isn't a two-year purchase, it's not a three-year purchase, right? If you think about it more, a little bit more long-term, and Alan has said it before, at first homes are average on six to seven years. I mean, through that time, you have an ability to grow that 
uh, equity, and it's also leverage. You're borrowing the bank's money to grow it. And so that is a huge, huge multiplier in terms of building worth, because if you put down 20% and the house goes up, that's a five times multiplier because you borrowed 80% from the bank, but you get 100% of what grows, right? The, the bank isn't the one that gets the gains. You just have to pay them the mortgage. And so that multiplier is, I think, why you know, people are so attracted to real estate is the ability to borrow. The other thing I'll just add real quickly here is um, also when you're looking at taking $200,000 out of your savings and buying a house, when you do buy anything else, go on vacation, buy a car, you kind of are spending the money and it's gone. But when you're buying a house, you're just moving it along your balance sheet into a different bucket called home equity, but your net worth stays the same. So, you know, don't think about it like I'm spending money. I'm just putting it in an illiquid account called home equity. And guess what? I can also live in that, in that thing. I have a roof over my head. So um, that's another thing. I think it helps people to not feel like they're spending it and the money's gone. So I'm going to wrap up. I have a few more slides um, that we could go into detail, but I'm, I'm going to just sort of in the interest of time, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of documents required that we would go through and Alan will talk a little bit, I'm sure, about the distinction between the being pre-approved and being pre-qualified. It's a beauty contest. We need to make you look more beautiful than the next person. And if you're pre-approved with no contingencies, it's a done deal. Then Alan gets to compete on price with you, not on terms. So we don't want you going in with a week, oh, I think you can get a loan. We want you going in with, no, this loan's a done deal. Just give me the house and then we can do appraisal. So that is a big distinction. We get you fully pre-approved so that Alan can make the best offer for you and, and, um, and have your offer shine. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn over to Alan to, and his team to, to lead you through more. And obviously, I'm here for questions if, if anybody has any. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And see, Nikki, I didn't even go like this. You kept us going. Right. You, did, you, didn't want, you didn't fall asleep? Oh, good. <laughs> Your presentation is always so um, terrific because oh. I always learn something new. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And um, so we already did the introduction. And so uh, we, my team, just because I know there's some new people on here as well, my team, uh, is Jacob Barnes, uh, Nikki Zanis, and we have uh, Megan Mitchell. So we assist anywhere from 20 to 30 home buyers, new home buyers a year. And so people don't get lost in the weeds. We pride ourselves in assisting these, these new home buyers. Overall, in the market today, overall sales are up, we found out in the news, uh, for April on the peninsula, 31%. People are moving. And they're moving here with multiple offers. The sales volume on the peninsula in April is down 21%. But guess what? Things are changing. As we are talking to agents, I am talking to agents from New York, um, uh, Naples, Florida, Chicago, um, and Scottsdale, Paris, Italy, Beverly Hills, and even San Francisco inventory is coming down the pipe. And as inventory comes down the pipeline, people from San Francisco are going to be moving to the peninsula. We've got New York, they're going to be moving to, um, uh, they're going to be moving to the outskirts. They want to get out of the apartment living and they want to be moving to the burbs. And mortgage rates are historically low and they're going to continue to stay that way for a while. Buyers right now, technology, they're, they're embracing it. They're rapidly embracing it even more. And so I was telling the team, you know, just the other day I went out on an appointment and a young woman, and we're going to call her Sharon because I can't remember her name, <laughs> um, told me about her home buying experience. And this was a pretty amazing to me. She was very excited about her house, which was great. She had just gotten into her new home, but this was her experience. She was working with a real estate agent for eight months and for eight months she and her husband had written nine offers nine offers for an eight months after losing out on writing bids for get this twenty two thousand they lost one house over twenty two thousand dollars another bid they lost another house over ten thousand dollars another bid they had lost another house over writing an offer for nine thousand dollars and this one really kicked me in the pants $5,000 they lost a bid over a house. 
And she talked about how great her agent was and how her agent stuck with them. Her agent stuck with them through the process. And she didn't even realize that um, she was assisting driving up the market because writing all of these offers, she was driving up the market. She had missed out on eight homes and she continued paying someone else's mortgage for all of those months. And she was actually living the definition of insanity by doing the same thing over and over again. So the interesting thing is um, I, I do things by telling stories. And so we meet, my team and I, what we do is we meet with we, buyers, uh, first time home buyers. And actually when I started out in real estate, one of my favorite things to do was to meet with first time home buyers. Um, my husband and I, we have owned many homes and I had the joy of meeting, starting with my business and starting out with first time home buyers. And that's how I started my business was worth working with home buyers and first time home buyers. And what, what I did was I created a home buyer presentation. And in that home buyer presentation, we created a buyer booklet. Yes, we have a buyer booklet. And what we do is we talk about how we assist home, home buyers with um, finding the right area for buyers. Because what we do is we, we know the nooks and crannies of the neighborhoods and making sure that they're happy with the areas and we go over these areas with buyers. We also go over the processes of writing offers and we go over what the expectations are gonna be. And so I'm not gonna go over the whole buyer booklet, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk to you about the actual writing process of, a, of an offer just very briefly. So when we meet with um, buyers, so it'll either be Nikki or myself, or it'll be um, Jake or myself, and maybe Megan will be there. And then also um, Nikki James may be there on a Zoom call. And so what we do is we, we go over the process so that you are not sharing. That's the, that's the, whole, um, uh, the whole idea behind this. So like for instance, what Sharon went through is um, she found her first home and it was probably her dream home, this first home. And this was their home. They will review all the disclosures and in the disclosures will include the inspections, will include seller's reports, will include everything about the house that the seller had to say about the house. Unfortunately, the buyers aren't really trusting, like Sharon wasn't really trusting in the process 100%. And unfortunately, she wasn't, they weren't trusting in the loan process. They didn't trust that um, they were fully pre-approved through underwriting. They were, they were probably maybe, um, they, um, uh, they weren't trusting in the uh, appraisal process. And they, but this is what they were doing. They were agonizing on writing their first offer and they were agonizing on price. And when the time came to write their offer, they were agonizing over the contingencies. And what a contingency is, it's a safeguard that allows time for a buyer to renegoti renegotiate if a house doesn't qualify 100%, um, whether it be on an appraisal, if a house doesn't appraise when you're writing an offer. And an appraisal is really what a, a bank says that a house is worth. That's not really, and that, that, that is a true, that is a misconception on what a value of a house is because the true value of a house is what a buyer is willing to pay for it. And then there's the loan contingency. If a buyer is pre-approved through underwriting, there may not be the need of a contingency. And that's where Nikki comes in and she will advise if, if they if a contingency is really needed and that's where you have to trust in the process and then there's the property contingency if there's inspections on the house and that mean that means a property inspection a pest inspection a roof inspection a chimney inspection there may not be the need to actually have a um, an actual contingency process at that point and but this is the interesting thing a buyer may be reading online that this is advised. Or there may be somebody, um, a parent or a grandparent or somebody that is um, stating that, you know what, 
you should have your own inspection because maybe a parent who is funding says, you know what, 45 years ago or 50 years ago when I purchased a house, it was advised that you get an inspection. So, but that's not true necessarily true today. And again, the buyer is going to agonize over price and probably not offer the highest price and say, you know what, let the seller counter. So, and again, this could be a family member who is advising. The buyers are gonna agonize over a lot of things and that's okay. All of this, Did Alan freeze up? Looks like it, yep. Alan froze. Yep. He's cute, frozen. Hill, it's <laughs> Hillsboro. Uh, Nikki, you want to jump in for him? You so, guys. Nikki or Jake? Ahead. Yeah, I can jump in if he's completely out. We're, well, What's that? did I unfreeze? Oh, there you are. I can hear him now. Did I unfreeze? Yeah, there you yes. go. There you are. Ah, good. Okay, where did I leave off? Um, let's see, you were... Uh, uh, contingencies. Yeah, you're right, you were on contingencies and talking about how we don't, you were a little bit past, uh, we don't always need them. Um, okay, um, did I talk about that um, uh, we don't always need contingency? So we don't always need contingencies. Yeah, you were kind of discussing how there's a lot of different things that the buyers agonize about. I mean, okay, you know, it's our job with our team to kind of obviously guide through that process. And you know, um, did I talk about the loan contingencies, the property inspection contingencies? Yep, yep, you got past property. Yeah. Okay, and that the um, did I talk about that the buyers will agonize over price, and this yep. won't always matter if there's going to be a um, if there's going to be multiple offers. You start right there. Okay, so what's gonna happen is, is that if there's multiple offers on a property, uh, it's not gonna really matter depending on how the offer is written, if there's gonna be contingencies written in the offer. Because what's gonna happen is I'm gonna end up, or Jake's gonna end up calling, or Nikki's gonna end up calling, and we're gonna end up calling the buyer and saying, you know what, you didn't get the offer, you didn't get the house, because of the contingencies. And what's gonna happen at that point is we're gonna end up writing another we're gonna end up finding another home and we're gonna start the process again. And, and when we write the second offer, the, the buyer's gonna start trusting in the process. And at this point, they will, they will write with less contingencies. So there maybe will be a loan contingency and we'll umbrella the appraisal under the loan contingency. We're gonna, the seller, the buyer's gonna agonize with the price again. And they'll think maybe they'll keep their fingers crossed that the seller will counter and they're gonna lose sleep over their price. You know, they're gonna lose sleep over their offer. And what's gonna happen at this point again, we're gonna call and say, you know what? There were multiple offers, but you didn't get this house again. I wanna make sure that you guys didn't freeze. Are you still all there? We're all here, yeah. We're here. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't wanna keep talking. <laughs> okay, so and what transpires at this point is the buyers are starting to, um, they're starting to trust in the process. And so like Sharon started to also get a little discouraged because now with Sharon, she had written eight offers. That was a lot of offers to have written. So with, uh, when you've written two offers, buyers start to get tired. It was, it surpri surprised me that Sharon wrote eight offers, but Regardless, what I have found with couples, especially there's going to be one that's going to be a little more tired than the other. And so when they found their third house, they're, again, they're going to go through the process of reviewing all the disclosures again. They're going to ask questions. They're going to get excited. And at this point, they're going to be all in 100%. There's going to probably be no loan contingency, no appraisal contingency, no property contingency, and they're going to be at their highest and best. And guess what? We're going to make that phone call and we're going to tell them, you got your home. After telling clients this story, and usually it's maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter, it just depends on if they have questions. And we don't have, cli we don't have clients like Sharon. 
we have clients that are hundred percent in we do um, for us we don't have buyers that are with us for eight months six months we typically have clients that are with us for three months and that's on average when buyers are ready when they're truly ready when they have that pre-approval they're in their house within 45 to 60 days and i know that sounds crazy but it is true we pride ourselves not only on our relationship with our clients but the relationship with the other agents on the other side excuse me oh, with the other side and so this is the process how it should be when buying real estate it should be easy it should be it should be fun it should be something that you have a good time with so it should not be a painstaking process and for and this is one of the reasons that we work so well with compass um, financial and because we work so well together because when the clients are ready and the same with nikki it is we we're, we are a strong team running together so that our clients are 100 percent so who has questions? Well, I have a couple things to add to that. Um, so one, we do work with clients for longer than a few months if they're not ready, right, Alan? If they're so not ready. <laughs> if they're not ready, it doesn't mean don't come to us. We work with people for years sometimes helping them get ready. Um, so that's one. And then two, I think one of the things is in other areas, it's different than the Bay Area. So a lot of times people hear about kind of the national standard of real estate and they try to apply it to the Bay Area. And it doesn't quite work that way because our market is very particular as far as with contingencies and inspections because they're provided most of the time where they're not provided in other parts of the country. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. It's the Bay Area in particular is like that. So that's yeah, true. Even sure. if you go to Sacramento or Los Angeles, a lot of the times, um, you know, those, those inspections are provided after the fact. You provide them yourself and honestly, it's been beneficial for buyers here in the Bay Area that we're able to move as quickly as we can because, you know, when you're listing a property, you provide all that up front. And for us, it gives us the perfect opportunity to really educate the client on, you know, what it is they're looking at with the property. And that's what's really going to kind of settle all of their concerns because um, obviously this can be a very emotional process. Right. Yeah. We want, and we want you to be comfortable with your purchase. We're not saying in any way, hey, we don't want you to get, you know, get a, a, a inspection contingency. It's just that they're provided, you know, they're provided up here. So, and most of the comp companies are very reputable that we use. So we look at the company as well. Uh, who did the, you know, who did the pest inspection, who did the property inspection? And we see, hey, do we know these guys? Is, is this a company that we trust? And most of the time the answer is yes. And if it's not, well, then, then we tell you, hey, we don't know these people. Um, this report doesn't look very good so you know then we'll recommend hey you should probably get one but in that case we won't be the only ones it'll be other other offers will be doing the same thing if you have some kind of crappy report that's been provided so yeah quick question from the crowd uh i think the answer is no but do you guys operate in sacramento or have any good realtors to refer to people in sacramento yes we refer <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we are connected with with realtors really anywhere throughout the country so um you know if you're relocating we can always refer you to reputable agents that we have relationships with well and it's not just throughout the country it's actually around the world so one of the um uh, websites that we started was global realtor network so we can refer Russia, we can refer Paris, we can refer, it, it's pretty amazing. We have a global reach. Awesome. Yeah, if you guys don't mind sending me that referral to someone in Sacramento, I'd love to give it to this person that asked. Sure. Um, there's also another panelist, uh, a panel question. Uh, what's the best way for family to help contribute to down payments? I think this is speaking more to gifting I'm not sure if we covered that in the very beginning, but love to hear your thoughts on that, Nikki. Yeah, no, we didn't. And it's a super way. Honestly, in this area, people either um, get into a house because they have stock income or they have family gifts. It's very hard to save your way to a down payment, except with some of those low loan to value programs. So yes, family gift is great. Um, <clears throat> in our eyes, it's a gift, whether it is uh, in your IRS eyes and the um, estate plan probably not but i won't go into too much detail there but yes there's a gift form it's for the purpose of, of securing the loan and um 
it's a great way to, to get to a different price range. Um, you can use, you know, a family's equity line. If they have an equity line on their home, they don't have to liquidate the cash to do it, but it is a great, great way to help with down payment. Interesting. I actually didn't know about that HELOC option. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're getting close to the hour. Um, so just want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, I'll just conclude with my last comment, and, and that's what Alan and Jake and Nikki all touched on. This is a very emotional process. Uh, you're going to see a home. You're going to start building your life in that home before you even get that accepted offer. Um, so I think Alan's you know, story around being fully committed so you don't run into that disappointment is very, very important. At the same time, we also, on our end, Alfred and Ray and mine, we get a lot of clients trying to time the market. They treat it like a stock. Uh, my response to that is if you get into a payment schedule that is uh, comfortable for your budget and you get into a home that you love, who cares about timing the market? I mean, if, if we're thinking about this as a seven plus year horizon, we're going to make money over time. Uh, I bought my home in San Francisco in 2018. I don't have a gain in mind yet, but guess what? I love my home in San Francisco. Um, so I don't think timing the market with real estate is as important as it may seem. It's not buying Apple stock. Uh, it's buying a lifestyle for yourself. Um, so keep that in mind and uh, hope everyone, you know, enjoyed this webinar and found it informational. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out to, to us at Compass, Alan's team and Nikki. Uh, we're all here to help you. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And I look forward to the next one with you all. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank you. It.